Do you think that the UK is uh, fit, ready and able to defend ourselves? I think we're a lot more fit and able than some would think. And I think just like uh, we surprised the world in some ways when the, the Argentines seeking to catch us at what they perceived as a very weak and decayed uh, point in our national cycle, tried to seize the Falklands. It's on my mind because Falklands Day was yesterday. And uh, Britain certainly shocked the Argentines with our ability to defend them. And so the question that arises in my mind is, I don't know if this is the 90th risk on the risk register you were just talking about. Could we do that again? And to that end, I actually don't regard the news you've been highlighting of, of these soldiers failing their fitness tests. I don't regard that as a bad thing. I regard it as a good thing that we still have the standards and they're willing to talk about the fact people have failed them. Because if you've got something like this happening, at least you can hold people to standards and seek to get them fit again. Most, believe me, most of the time in the public sector, if you find people are failing standards, they change the standards, not the people. Here, God bless our army, they say we're going to get you fit. I respect your uh, ability to see the positives in that. I can tell you that. Peter, do you share the optimism? No. Um, oh. it's, it's several points. The Falklands, we very, very nearly lost. And it was only because uh, the Conservative government at the time had failed to sell off and get rid of several important ships that the Navy were able to mount the, the rescue operation, the task force, which took the Falklands back. It was a very close-run thing. And we very nearly lost it. And it's an illustration of this best-known fact, all military planners, all wars come out of the blue as a surprise in a shape you weren't expecting. And to deal with that, you have to have properly trained, competent, reasonably sized armed forces with a very wide range of abilities. I don't think we have that. I think ever since the end of the Cold War, the governments of both parties have used the opportunity to cut back on military, naval and air force spending to the point where we now simply don't have adequate defences. Certainly, in, in military terms, uh, the, that 22,500 figure of those who didn't pass the fitness test, that's more than a quarter of the army that we have now. Uh, our army is so tiny, it's smaller than the one which Hitler allowed Vichy France to maintain after they surrendered in 1940. It's that small. Uh, the Navy, which I feel very strongly about because my father was in it, uh, is, a, again, a pitiful shadow of its former self. When I was a defence reporter in the 1980s, it was always stated that the Navy's surface fleet of destroyers and frigates would never fall below a, about 50. And now it's way below that. And quite a large number of those, I think, are probably tied up alongside, not really able to move. And there are major problems of retention in all the armed services of the, of the crucial NCOs and experienced officers who keep armed forces together. I think we're, we're neglecting it to the point where it is becoming a serious crisis. And it needs to be addressed, but it costs a lot of money to maintain up-to-date armed forces. And we have cut. That in, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, it was still the case, I think, that we spent twice as much on defence as we did on education. Now it's the other way around. But are our schools particularly good? It doesn't N seem to me. That no that. disagreement from me on headcount and no disagreement from me on spending. I think in the current environment, it's plain. There are, there are so many threats uh, facing uh, Britain and the wider West that we should be upping our spending on defence. But one of the things that does reassure me somewhat is Open that... It and which area would you increase your spending on? What, the, the boots on the ground, the military aircraft? Where would you spend that? There's certainly, I mean, thank goodness these things aren't entirely up to me, but I certainly think that the military needs more resource. And two obvious things to me is upping the headcount in soldiers who operate at the pointy end. So I would have, I would have more infantrymen in, in our uh, military. But why, though? But because the pushback to that would be, why do you need all these boots on the ground when you're a member of NATO? Because we deploy our army all the time, and it's one of the few properly trained good ones. So that's part one. But Part two is that I would spend a great deal more on what the Ukraine conflict has, has demonstrated to be so useful, which is drone technology, unmanned um, aer aer aerial vehicles and so forth, because the ability to deliver um, ordnance very quickly um, without risk to even a single person on your side seems in the modern media age to be highly attractive uh, to the person launching an offensive, but also highly effective uh, on the other side. It's clear that Russia fears few things in the course of their conflict with Ukraine. They don't fear fear their own death count, but they do fear single raids by um, drones, and that has really put it up them do in they? a way that other things happen. Do they fear that? I wouldn't know. Um, I'm not sure they're particularly... I don't think Russia worries very much about British armed forces, I have to say. It's not 
Uh, We've had to scramble two RAF jets. Is it today? Is that news well, today? Well, you don't know. We always talk about this melodramatic scramble and intercept. What happens is some, some Russian planes fly some way past our airspace and we send up some aircraft to go and fly alongside them. It isn't actually the big drama that it's made out to be. But leave that aside. Uh, you mentioned NATO. One of the interesting things about the Falklands is because it was out of NATO area. Uh, NATO members did not have any... Um, any desire or responsibility to help Britain against it. And it was quite a struggle to get the United States, which is very divided on the issue, uh, to give us the support which most people expected them to give us at that time. You might well be on your own. It's, a, it's an insurance policy. Most of the time when you spend money on insurance, it goes down the drain until you really need it, whereupon it hasn't gone down the drain. That's what, insur- that's what defence spending is about. We certainly, the army is absurdly small. It, could, it simply isn't... A, a, an effective size anymore. Uh, international experts are beginning to say it no longer deserves to be called an army. We need to do something about that. And we spent, we spend, I think it's something in the region of four and a half to five billion on the Ukrainian war uh, in the past uh, couple of years. Now, some of us would argue that this is a rather bizarre concern for Britain, which has no obvious interest in the Ukrainian war, but uh, whether it is so or not, if, if we're spending that kind of money there, we don't have it to spend on maintaining our own defences. And it's sure. an important consequence. Uh, it's not just military um, threats. So when I look at this list, there's a whole kind of host of things. That you've got pandemics. Potential. Yeah, you've got potential cyber attacks, uh, food supply contamination, wildfires, um, that's in there, storm damage, uh, severe space weather, volcanic eruptions, uh, and then societal as well, public disorder, industrial action, they are listed as well as threats yeah. uh, that could risk life in the UK as we know it. Yeah, and the important thing to remember about that is that whilst we, in the modern age, on the one hand, as Peter has been uh, rightly setting out, underspend on our military, we also seem to think our military is the answer to almost everything. If you've got a problem in the immigration system, send in the troops. If you've got a shortage of firefighters because they're out mm-hmm. on strike, send in the troops and so forth. So actually, um, I, I, I unfashionably don't think the military is the answer to everything, and I certainly don't think that the military is the answer to urban unrest and to um, no heaven civil... for heaven for fun that we have, we have to do that. That's the very third world. Uh... Exactly, the army is for fighting in the end, and if you send the army onto the streets, it will do what it does. It is not a civil law enforcement. Um, Why not? Uh, some would say that actually, when you look at the streets and the disorder that's going on, some would argue that the police are more bothered about policing pronouns and hate speech on Twitter yes. than. Well, military. And reform the police, Michelle. You, 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 can't, you can't bring the army in because that. It's been the tradition of this country, and one of the things which distinguished it from all the other great empires. This was a naval power, not a military power, and which is why we never developed the huge uh, domestic land army to overawe the population, which you would have found in Germany. Cor- correct. Uh, and, 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 and Russia and, and countries of that kind. We've never had it. And it's always been. been any politician who even dreams of using the military in politics or industrial relations is quite rightly uh, becomes very unpopular because people see it's, it goes beyond uh, what we should be doing. And it's a misuse of an it's army. It's an inappropriate use. Pay for it's to an, defend the country. Inappropriate use of state power. Yeah. But the, uh, the problem is. I bet I, a lot of my viewers would completely disagree. They were shouting okay. at you. Well, hang well, on. Well, they, 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 might well dis- they might well agree with you in setting out what you think the problems are with our current police force. And I would agree a, a great deal with of what you said. But that, the answer to that is to fix the police, yes. not to send in the army. Yeah, but then is that doable? And yes, it people. is doable. It's completely doable, and it would take it would take a sensible government probably four or five years to do it. What you do, and I've been urging it for some time, uh, is you is you set up new police forces in, in every location, proper local police forces of the kind they have in the United States and as we used to have here, not the vast amalgamated blobs which we have now. Uh, you train them in what police are supposed to do, which is uh, which is preventive foot patrols, uh, to to raise the levels of of, of, of uh, contentment with and safety among the population and to deter crime and when they're ready you disband uh, the existing failed police forces and and and, and send them home it, right. it wouldn't take long it would be effective it would work and, and anybody who had any serious interest in the welfare of this country would be planning it now i see solutions short of going that far that may well work we've seen a couple of um you 
Policemen come in and are fa out of fashion, don't they? They tend to be talked about as the, the copper's copper and then something goes wrong. But the current uh, police uh, chief constables in fashion have done things like to, uh, insisting that every burglary has an uh, in-person response, not just issued a, a crime number, um, stop policing speech on Twitter and get out into your communities more. Yes, These but things this, work. This, but honestly, uh, it's just a complete misconception of what, of what the policing is about. Policing is not about... Every arrest is a failure. Uh, the investigation of crime is a failure. What, you cannot unburgle someone who's been burgled. You cannot unstab someone who's been stabbed. You cannot unmug someone who's been mugged. The police are there to prevent these things from happening in the first place. Yep. To do that, they have but to they be, also they have to be visibly, once those visibly present on the streets. If they were, then the amount of investigation they had to do would be hugely but diminished. They should still try and solve crime there. once they've happened. Well, sure, but it's a secondary, a very secondary... Solving, problem, solving crime is secondary for the police. Totally Don't secondary. The, 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 key, the key purpose of the police is the prevention of crime. That's what Robert Peel said. One of the main, of the main deterrents of criminals is the belief that they'll get caught. Well, it's one, but if you don't, if you're not present on the streets, then then they won't get caught.